Uh, hello, my name is Miles, and today I'll be briefly presenting on what I'm calling the fiction of total vision in Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon. So I'll be breaking this presentation into uh, two sections. In the first section, I'll be talking about what the Panopticon is, what the Panopticon accomplishes, and what the architecture looks like. And then the second part, I'll be giving a brief overview into uh, the architectural symbolism of the Panopticon and how that image of this architectural device has become a social image for the construction of utopian and surveillance societies. So the Panopticon was created around 1789 by English philosopher Jeremy Bentham. He created or commissioned someone to create these two drawings. So in its basic form, it is the plan of the ideal prison. So that image on the left shows the floor plan of the structure. You just have a guard tower in the middle. You have surveillance corridors. Then you have a section of the same building. And so in the first part, I'll just be giving you a brief overview into how the Panopticon functions. So it's a uh, round structure that's about 100 feet diameter. It employs some of the new materials of iron, steel, and glass in the 1790s. It's 100 feet diameter. Around the perimeter of the circle stretch individual cells. Each cell is nine feet deep with that guard tower in the, with that donut in the middle. And here we have the view of the cell. Each cell has a uh, prison and uh, toilet or sanitation, plumbing, and work area, so the person is confined to their cell 24 hours a day. And it's designed with ventilation lines, with the idea of miasma theory and the theory that if you ventilate the prison better, it will be better, more healthful, so it's a reform device. Then on every other floor, there was a surveillance corridor. This is all designed or modeled according to Bentham's exact instructions in his text, where each in each of these three surveillance corridors, a single guard, can survey two prisoners and two tiers of cells. The guard can see the prisoners, but the prisoners cannot see the guards, so there is this one-way visibility. You watch, but you do not know when you are being watched. So three guards each see 96 prisoners, which makes 288 prisoners total. And this gives you an idea of how the Panopticon functions. Uh, there is, in the middle of the space, there is an auditorium where the prisoners can gather to attend chapel. And then within this auditorium in the back, there arises a screen that prevents views from the prisoners looking into the chapel or seeing each other from across the void of the empty space in the middle. So the Panopticon is a complex, almost technological kind of structure that sits in this historical context of, I think, uh, Enlightenment thought and Utopian thought in the 1780s and 1790s. There arises also throughout the space, of course, a stairwell linking the floors and employs all these new materials of brick, iron, glass technology as a kind of reform architecture, an architecture that reforms the prison or rationalizes the prison form by individualizing each prisoner in a separate cell. And that completes the Panopticon as this 100 foot diameter circle that rises six floors and is easy to survey inside. Now we're going to enter the Panopticon and I'll just give you a brief point of view of what it looks like inside this space based on this computer model. Into the space on this side is the guard tower or the blinds you can't see in, but they can see out. You see the individual cells and the up above the tiers of walkways that link the different cells together. 
Then as you rise up through the space, and you turn around, you will get a view into the individual prisoner's cell. There we go. And we'll go and continue back around the space and begin to enter the auditorium in the middle in a moment. So this is just to give an idea of what the architectural space looks like. And then in the second part, I'll talk about how it was applied. There is the guard surveillance corridor. You pass through that corridor into the space where the prisoners would gather to be lectured. You'll look up. Benson talks about how, about how circulation of air goes through these pipes, these columns that rise to the space and kind of heat the space and uh, ventilate it. You could exit through the ceiling. We go into the bottom, we exit out. There's that cross section of floor plan we saw earlier. That completes the panopticon. And here we have this quote in the second part where we talk, we talk briefly about how the panopticon was reused and repurposed. And Michel Foucault writes in 1975 that this enclosed, segmented space observed at every point in which the individuals are inserted in a fixed place in which the slightest movements are supervised, in which all events are recorded, in which an in uninterrupted work of writing links the center and periphery, which power is exercised without division, according to a continuous hierarchical figure, which each individual is constantly located, examined, and distributed among the living beings, the sick and the dead. All this constitutes a complex model of the disciplinary mechanism. So Foucault's really taking this architectural form and applying it, I feel, as a social institution for the oper operative mechanisms of societies as a whole. Uh, he talks about this sense of one-way visibility as well, that the major effect of the panopticon to induce the inmate state of conscious and permanent visibility that is, they are always watched, and assures the automatic functioning of power. So to arrange things that the surveillance is permanent in its effect, that is, the prisoners think that they're always watched and must act as if they were always watched, even if it is discontinuous in its action, that is, the guards do not always have to be in the central tower, or might not always be watching the prisoners, same as the fact that our department technician, Stan Affini, might or might not be looking at my internet history. Uh, even if it's discontinuous in its action, that the perfection of power should tend to render its actual exercise unnecessary. So you have this architectural form that seems to render power unnecessary or seems to abstract it. However, I'd like to begin to question this commonly accepted form that the panopticon can model uh, social institutions. Uh, so we have this book from 1998 called Seeing Like a State, in which he writes that no administrative system is capable of re representing any existing social community except through a heroic and greatly schematized process of abstraction. The panopticon is an abstraction of how society functions. It is an exaggeration. It is not simply a question of capacity, although like the Horace, a human community is surely far too complicated and variable to easily yield its secrets to bureaucratic formulae, to the guard in the middle. It is also a question of purpose. State agents have no interest, nor should they, in describing an entire social reality. The person is individualized in their cell. Google is uninterested in you as a person. They're interested in you as a set of data, set of information, they collect that information, they don't care about your personality, they care about selling you ads. So there is this sim simultaneous sense where in some ways the panopticon is analogous to modern society, but there are ways in which we might begin to deconstruct or question the degree to which the panopticon, as Foucault claims, or as, or as is often commonly accepted, can actually model social institutions. You have also, to the contrary, this quote from Bentham, where he 
seemingly in the opposite, an oppositionist guy, he writes that to say on one word that Tanopticon will be found applicable without exception to all establishments whatsoever, in which within a space not too large to be covered or commanded by buildings, a number of persons may be kept under inspection, no matter how different or even opposite the purpose. So there is this tension right here. Bentham talks about how the Panopticon is a universalizing kind of institution, and then we can kind of deconstruct it, kind of try to move that into the modern era and question whether that is indeed so. There is also above right here the view from the guard tower into the prisoner's cell from the model, and then from the prisoner's cell back to the guard tower we have that sense of one-way visibility enforced, which Bentham says can be used in the design of hospitals and prisons and schools, which has kind of a darker undertone, which Foucault really picks up on, where this reforming structure becomes something darker, becomes an a symbol of surveillance, even though it began as something that was to reform people. Uh, Bentham's and furthermore, Bentham's Panopticon, whether Bentham realized it or not, had an important flaw, namely the possibility that the watch might one day try to find out whether they are indeed being watched. An inmate could hazard, entirely at random, a minor pardonable transgression. If this transgression goes unnoticed, then he could commit another, this time more serious transgression. And here we have that guard's point of view. We have this, this showing where actually a single guard does not see into all the cells, but they only see into a few cells at a time because of the corridors. And they must walk circles around the space to continually survey. So we speak of multiple different kind of silos in this space, not in a central point of view, but multiple ones. So Google collects information about you, the NSA collects information about you, but they may or not, may not be in communication with each other unless they're in China. It's despite the final scheme's forceful sectional diagonality, its radiating lines of vision extend not from a central point of authority, but from the middle inspection galleries. And then in the modern period, later on moving forward through time, we have this image of the Panopticon applied to the design of hundreds of prisons around the world specifically starting in 1829 with Eastern State. Here we have that floor plan of Eastern State. In the center is that single guard tower in all the green with the radio surveillance corridors. In the red, we have the individual cells. Orange, we have the individual prisoners' exercise yards. So we have this panoptic formula that is extended from the circle to cover a, a cross-section, a larger area. We have two views of what that looks like with the original guard tower or the radiating cells. And this form of the, of the radial prison was applied to the design of over 300 prisons around the world, and many dozen in the UK. So we have this panopticon, this social reality, social idea that begins to have an architectural concrete realization, where the panopticon is the most influential prison ever built. There are about 300 world prisons around the world based on Eastern States hub and smoke for this hub and spoke for this radial floor plan. And so in this modern period, uh, Foucault locates located the disciplinary societies in the 18th and 19th centuries. They reach their height at the outside of the 20th. They initiate the organization of vast spaces of enclosure. The individual near the seizes passing from one enclosed environment to another, each having its own laws. First the family, then the school, then the barracks. Foucault constructs this kind of universality of, the, of, of, of this disciplinary mechanism, saying that it follows you throughout life. And I'd like to question whether that is indeed so. And so here we just have, uh, in conclusion, we have this Google engram, which charts the incidence of words uh, appearing in printed literature. So here we, I just did a search for Panopticon, who were best in the invented structure in the 1790s. This is when most of the Panopticons were built. And this is when the internet comes into existence. So we have these different peaks of Panopticism, where this architectural form 
is translated into this digital form, which has some difficulties in that translation process, some problems. Here we can just kind of map different events onto that timeline. We have events and events of Panopticon, Eastern State is built. The prison is modeled after Eastern State in that period, several hundred of them, mostly in that period. In later periods, different kinds of prisons proliferate, and so the Panopticon becomes less powerful. Face different kinds of prison designs, and then the, when the internet has founded this real boost in growth. Then, in conclusion, I would like to end on this quote right here, that uh, one pitfall of seeing surveillance as an all-encompassing feature of society, but also in approaches where surveillance is used as a lens to analyze certain developments, is that theoretical accounts often talk in abstract entities, institutions, the government, networks, and then, namely Foucault talks in these abstract entities. <coughs> These entities are described as invisible forces exercising power over subjects. This perspective often ignores any form of situatedness, context, or the specificities of surveillance technologies and practices. So it is this quote that the panopticon is applicable to all institutions whatsoever, but in some sense it is not. So in some sense there are limitations to the degree to which we can apply that image. So in terms of the future de de development of that research I, would, research, I would like to look at how far we can push the image of the panopticon into anal analyzing modern surveillance states. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening.